Hey, Rick Bucata, Jerry Hoffman, coming to you, the uh, January 2012 issues of Primary Care Medical Abstracts. Uh, Jerome? We're back. Yeah, we are. We didn't do it ne- last month, but we had some great people do it last month. Steve Brown and David uh, Newman, terrific job, guys. They did it at my house. They both came over to uh, L.A., and um, we had we had dinner with them, and I, I enjoyed kind of the uh, – it was nice of them to come. David comes all the way from New York, and Steve came from Tempe. Yeah. Pretty nice. Uh, Meanwhile, did you say 2012? Is that what yes, you I did. Yes, I did. <laughs> yes, Holy I did. mackerel. Yes, I did. Oh, boy. You got any New Year's resolutions, Jerry? Uh, yeah. I'm, How about, going, I'm going back going to, to 2009. Nice to <laughs> <laughs> I'm always nice to you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to push this button. We're going to get started you here. Know, okay, <laughs> Chief? You got anything else to say? <laughs> <laughs> Could be in trouble now. <laughs> All right, Ricky, we're going to go. Uh, uh, the first one is entitled The Use of... Now... They need to give us pronunciation help on these when they come up with these. Dabigatran. What did you, you say? Dabigatran. That's what I said. My sister said Dabigatran. That's what she said yesterday. Well, she's allowed. <laughs> this is u- the use of this. Uh, Trust me, the reason they have these <laughs> terrible names is so that we'll never use them. Pradaxa is the trade name yeah. here. And I know you don't watch TV, but there's been a lot of commercials, a lot of direct-to-consumers on this drug. Really? Absolutely. Absolutely, and by cardiologists, real doctors, kind of thing, uh, not uh, you know people impersonating doctors. This is a study about <laughs> this anticoagulant, uh, direct thrombin inhibitor. And now they're, and we're talking about this. There's a uh, new one. There's a new one beyond this one. Yes, there is. Actually, you're, you're correct. Apixaban. In any case, I this is. is what it is. Uh, they said the Rely trial was the one that made this drug uh, okay by the FDA. It's for use in atrial fibrillation. They actually said it caused less bleeding in um, the younger people who were on it, uh, but it actually caused more bleeding in the older people uh, who were on it. And um, this drug is largely excreted through the kidneys. And uh, this is a French case report, two case reports of people, one who had a. <laughs> this is cool, Jerry. They died of a fecal disimpaction, died because they bled to death, and the other person had a bunch of nosebleeds, and they measured their blood levels of this drug, and they were, you know, like two, three hundred times more than they're supposed to be, and uh, they said, hey, what's the story? The RELY trial really didn't pay attention to these older people, and yet the older people are going to be disproportionately put onto this drug, and yet they are the skinny people, the ones with renal insufficiency, and... uh, Multiple so, other drugs. And com- comorbidities and those kinds of things. And so this is generically uh, talks about the, this, the, the, the exclusion of older people from trials. Right. And the, and the fact that can, consequently they wind up getting more of the drug because they've got the, sick, the sicknesses. And there was a nice little commentary. Did you see this commentary about this paper? The, um, the guy says... It's not uncommon for clinical trials to exclude the oldest of the old, and we, we've gone into that. But I like the second part. Patients are more worried about adverse events to potential benefits. So we've done studies that specifically, and this is not unique to the elderly, where patients, when you tell them, here's what's going to do, and here's, here's the side effects, they are not interested in tolerating any side effects. Yeah. And uh, so this is a, right. a, 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 an issue in this drug, so, in this, in this so drug. Nice little uh, case report. The nice part is that it's from Hôpital Lariboisière. Yeah, right. Sure, which whatever is, that is. Which is where I worked. Actually, it didn't ex- actually exist. The the forerunner of Lariboisière was Hôpital Fernand Vidal, which is where I spent the year. Remember that? A uh, long time ago. Yes. Long and, time ago. and then they moved over to this place. So I know this place. I know exactly where it is, right by the Gare du Nord in uh, Paris in um brings up great memories. You know, case reports, we shouldn't overreact to case reports. One person, who knows? Um, And people have asked me a lot about this drug and the other one that's now come out, and are they any good? You know, we have very limited information. Uh, Sponsored trials say all these great things, and these guys point out that maybe the sponsored trials don't always tell the truth for a lot of reasons, including exclusion and inclusion and these special issues with the people who are um, who are the most sick, who get excluded from the trials, but in real life are exactly the people who get the drugs. And if not more so, yes. Yeah. So, um, so I think there are much bigger points about this than about these two cases, or even about dabigatran. It's about uh, really maintaining skepticism when you read these glorified 
um, early reports. And, you know, we'll just have to see. Maybe, you know, we've been waiting for years to have a better Coumadin, and we haven't. And that doesn't mean it'll never happen, but uh, I'm not immediately jumping on the bandwagon of any of these just because the first report says good. I can't understand that. Good. You're not jumping on the bandwagon? <laughs> you know, if it was up to you, you know, there'd be no new drugs. No, only good ones. All right, let's go number two. Two is about bacterial endocarditis prophylaxis uh, since the change in the NICE guideline in 2008. It's by Thornhill in the BMJ. And uh, what does that guideline say? You'll remember that uh, we did the paper where the where NICE, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence in England, said, you know, we don't need to do nearly as much uh, bacterial endocarditis prophylaxis as we always thought. And they gave a lot of reasons why they thought it was way overdone and really wasn't an issue and not, shouldn't worry about it. And they came out with um, much more restrictive guidelines for when you should do a prophylaxis. And this paper now looks, three years later, what was the effect of that? And the good news is that there was a dramatic 80% decrease in prophylaxis, but no measurable effect in uh, bacterial endocarditis in the number of cases. Now, the one thing I got to say that um, that is really hard to imagine is that they that there was no difference because they said there there are, it's been 125 cases a month before and after. That seems like an enormous number. Of uh, bacterial endocarditis? Yeah. There's been no change? Yeah. Suggesting, uh, even though we dropped down the use of this we stuff We dropped down lot, the use of uh, the but the, but, but the amount of endocarditis, maybe I read it wrong, but I think it says it's it's it still is 125 cases a month. 125 a month in England, in, in the UK? We got a lot of people there. That's that's a lot of endocarditis. Anyway, the, the same recommendations were made in the uh, U.S. Yes. about it. And uh, basically, they, they they think that uh, they've proven that uh, you don't need to Maybe do this. Maybe it's 125 a year. Because it looks like total number. Oh, no, this is prescriptions. I think. Well, whatever. I apologize. Whatever, whatever it is. <laughs> whatever. It, the key point is the same, but it still seems like a lot of cases. Anyway. All right. Then, uh, so it was, a good, it, was a good, right. it was a good decision, and it's working, so we shouldn't worry about it. Okay. Number three, childhood stroke by Yak Corrales. Uh, from Melbourne Children's Hospital. Uh, this is a chart review of 81 children uh, over five years of age, um, which is about one child per month during the time that they looked, uh, hospitalized through their tertiary care hospital's emergency department. Uh, many of these were transferred in from some other ED who had a diagnosis, an ultimate diagnosis of stroke. Three out of eight of these, eight of these were hemorrhagic stroke. In adults, remember, it's about maybe one out of eight, uh, maybe a little bit more than that. So uh, the hemorrhagic stroke is much more common relatively in children than it is in adults, although obviously the overall numbers are much less in children. Um, in fact, one of the key points of this is that we, we tend not to think about stroke in children, so we miss it all the time, and this is to remind us that it actually does exist. Almost all of those who had uh, uh, ischemic stroke had the typical symptoms of ischemic stroke, uh, weakness and speech problems. Those who had hemorrhagic stroke tended not to have much in the way of focal weakness, and therefore they were very much missed. They typically came in with an unusual headache, with vomiting, and or with altered mental status. And remember, in kids, altered mental status brings up a differential, a big differential, but you don't think stroke? So not surprisingly, there were long delays to presentation of these kids. When they got to the emergency department, they were triaged as non-emergent, particularly the hemorrhagic stroke, and then there were long sub subsequent delays to the diagnosis. So it was gotten wrong at every stage. This was true even for the ischemic stroke because people couldn't believe it was a stroke in a child, but it was far more true for hemorrhagic stroke. Now, those are the same sort of things that we notice in adults. That, uh, I agree, because, vomiting loss and altered consciousness is more, more consistent with the hemorrhage. But in both groups, including in these kids, it wasn't good enough to hang your hat on. So there were, there were some crossover, but they, these were the general differences. Um, the underlying cause was much more identifiable than in adults. In adults, we don't, you know, we say atherosclerotic disease, but that's as far as we get. Here there was a clear underlying cause in many cases. This is typically vascular disease, you know, a dissection, moya moya disease, or sickle cell disease, or a subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, etc. Um, not surprising. Kids don't get stroke just from having long history of 
uh, high blood pressure, 70 years of high blood pressure at age two. Um, anyway, so this is mostly a reminder to us that this does exist, that we should keep it somewhere distant in our radar. And then that strange headache or a kid who's got, you know, not just that they're nauseated, but they're, they got intractable vomiting. Think about intracranial types things. Um, and, uh, you know, just a, a little bit of a reminder. Yeah, there's been actually, we've uh, been reminded that this is uh, something that really does occur. We, we, we may never have seen a case, but the, the fact is children's it does hospitals occur. Do. Yeah, children's hospitals do. And it, you, you know, it, it's not common. We shouldn't over-diagnose it, but, um, but it's just something to, to remember that this can occur. And, you know, as a reflection of that, this paper makes it clear that these kids were, you know, their diagnosis was delayed, even though, you know, all of these sound kind of nasty. Number four. four, cryotherapy versus salicylic acid for a treatment of plantar warts. Jerry, did you know that plantar warts are caused by the human papillomavirus? Yes, I did. Did you know that? Yes. Anyway, the uh, idea here this is a British study. Uh, they say two million people seek out their family doctor for the treatment of plantar warts. So they looked at 242 folks, randomized to cryotherapy with that liquid nitrogen stuff, a maximum of four treatments every two to three weeks, which is... Compared we, with... We don't actually have to go with the doses because it didn't work. Wait a minute. No, <laughs> but I, the issue is the frequency. The frequency. It so didn't work. Every, every, they only came every three or four weeks and got a little treatment. Yeah. The other poor slobs had to put salicylic acid on their foot every day. Every day. Now, uh, obviously, nobody wants to do that. But in any case, they looked at the outcomes. And also, this was a very high dose of salicylic acid, uh, higher than the maximum allowed in the United States. And in any case, look at this. Complete clearance of all plantar warts at 12 weeks, a whopping 14% in both groups. Now, these poor slobs were putting the salicylic on for 12 weeks, and they got 14% cure rate. When they looked at six months, the cure rate was 30%, 35%. It's like, holy smokes. And since placebo works in up to 50%, this is not very good. Yeah, neither was good. And that's, but, and that's true of all the studies we've done on this. But when you looked at the people who were the happiest, it was the people who went every three or four weeks and got a, a cold treatment rather than the poor people putting the stuff on every day. So if you want to make somebody happy, freeze their foot. No, wait, wait a second. If they were happier. They were happier. That doesn't mean they would have been even more happy if you froze their foot once every year or even once every never Exactly, exactly. The, so this stuff didn't work very well. Once more, a therapy for plantar warts did not work. F number five, blood pressure targets in type 2 diabetes is by Bangalore. This is yours, Rick. Uh, this is, um, I thought that there was a bajillion papers that uh, basically said what should be the target for blood pressure, but apparently these guys didn't think there were. So they uh, did a, look at this, Jerry. This is from 1965 to 2010. That's uh, 45 years worth of studies these guys looked at, and they found 13 randomized controlled trials uh, looking at uh, blood pressure, 140, 135, and 130 in terms of outcomes. Uh, but this is not randomized to those. It's what did they achieve? And they're looking uh, for cardiovascular outcomes and microvascular outcomes, and uh, said, so what's blood pressure that you ought to shoot for? Um, so the baseline was 140. They said, actually, if you get tr shoot, shot for 135 or lower, you had a 10% reduction in all-cause mortality and a 17% reduction in strokes by shooting just for that 5 millimeter, uh, uh, millimeter no, difference. No, not for shooting for it. Did they achieve it? Is that what they got uh, down okay, to? Okay, got Very it. different. And then they looked at the people who uh, were 130 or less, and actually they found a slight incre uh, decrease in the risk of stroke over the 135, and, but that's all. There was no difference in my, so macro. So most of the benefit micro. was getting down a little, not getting down a lot. Yeah, 130. Now, now here's the more interesting part of this study, honestly. So when they compared 140 to 135, they found that, that there was there's some advantages. But they also found a 20% increase in serious adverse events. And when they took it down to 130, they found a 40% incidence of serious events. And you would think, well, that's kind of important. What are these serious events? So if you look in the paper, those of you watching on the video, this paper is 11 pages long with a nine-page supplement. It's 20 pages. Here is the paragraph on 
serious adverse events. It is about an inch tall. That's it. That's it. Yet 40% of people had these, whatever they were, serious events. And they don't tell you what they were. So I then emailed my friend here who wrote this paper, Dr. Um, Bangalore, and he said, uh, Good question. Dr. Picotta, thank you for your interest. This is an indeed a great question. I said, well, what are serious events? I, were you going to list these? It's pretty first? important, like, yeah. yeah. Exactly, they're serious. He said, the definition of serious adverse events is, a, is pretty standard. It's a FDA definition. For every study, it's the same definition. In any case, we however, we do not have a sense of the individual components of the serious adverse events from the trials as the reporting was very variable. So these, these serious events, which we don't know which they are, a lot of people were going to get them. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to take that? I, I do need to take that, but yes, I do need to take that. Oh, Jesus. I mean, do you... Number five. Do we do the whole thing? No, 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 no. I'm going to push a button and we'll start up again here. And you can, if you want to comment, you can. Hold on. Yeah, I do. Okay. So number five, I, I, as I mentioned to you in, in an email, I was really proud of you for doing that. That was a great, uh, um, great, important question that you asked. And it is sort of fascinating in this big time paper that they didn't even know what they were talking about as the major, most important outcome. That notwithstanding, I think their point is a really important one, which is that we all know that blood pressure control is the most important benefit in diabetes. All the other stuff pales in comparison to blood pressure. And so now, how far should you get it down? And the, But this flies, this, this they're, what they're saying goes against the, the notion of, well, if a little's good, more must be better. And what they point out is that you get most of the bang for your buck for a little. You lower the blood pressure a little, you get a lot of bang for your buck. If you lower it more, you get very little more except for now you start to get more harm. Now, you're right. We don't know exactly what the harm here was. And maybe it was it's terrible. Serious, it's serious. Maybe it was terrible and maybe it wasn't. But, but the notion is an important one. And when you have all these guidelines which tell us we're going to get penalized if our patients don't get down to X because that's the guideline and you have patients who you've tried three medicines and they're not down to X and you push more, you're more likely to cause harm than good even though that's what the guideline said. I will point out here that this is an association, not a cause. It wasn't randomized for one versus the other. So the ones who got down less probably were less sick. That's why they got down less. Who knows? That's But that's likely. Nevertheless, I do think it's important take-home points here. All right. Number six, effective exercise on hemoglobin A1C in type 2 diabetes. This is by Ampierre in uh, JAMA from Brazil. It's a meta-analysis of 47 randomized trials, over 8,500 patients, a structured exercise program, and it worked in terms of lowering the A1C. Uh, it worked even better when it was combined with diet, and it worked a fair amount. So the, uh, so the, the so Rick is pointing out to me that he knows what the right answer is here. Um, there are two things to say about this. One is what Rick has written on his paper here, which is this is not a patient-oriented outcome. Lowering the A1C, as we've ra railed about a million times, is not really the goal in diabetes. Lowering blood pressure to a reasonable amount is a good goal. And helping the patient and lowering A1C doesn't um, necessarily do that. In fact, I'm pretty confident that as a goal, it's crazy. It doesn't work. Um, it's a marker of disease, not the, not the endpoint of disease. That being said, I chose this paper anyway because um, <laughs> we're always talking about whether you should live healthy, diet and exercise versus take medicines, which 
not only cost more, but cause all sorts more harm. harm. And I, I would only point out that the amount of A1C lowering in this is so is better than we see with all these drugs. And if if somebody could sell this, boy, this would be on television everywhere, because um, uh, you know we we hear so much too little about diet and exercise, which are really important for um, for quality of life. Even though this doesn't measure anything important. <laughs> by it just the gives standard, you an opportunity by, to talk us, about it. Yeah, and by the standard measure, boy, it worked really, really well. We're going to talk a little bit later about uh, this in patient-oriented outcomes, but uh, I, thought it, I thought it gave me an opportunity. Yes, it did. Seven is effective early intensive multifactorial therapy on five-year cardiovascular outcomes in Id individuals who are screen detected to have uh, diabetes. Um, so this is occult diabetes. They, they didn't... They weren't sick. They just somebody found the blood sugar. And the, does early initiation of intensive uh, treatment basically decrease the occurrence of first cardiovascular events or a composite of cardiovascular death, MI, stroke, or revascularization? 3,000 patients from 318 general practices in Denmark, ne Netherlands, and the UK were randomized to usual care, which ap apparently was benign neglect, or intensive care <laughs> no. focusing on guideline-driven management of, of sugar, blood pressure, cholesterol, and promoting a healthy lifestyle. They followed these people 5.3 years on average, and um, the hazard ratio for the outcomes that were bad was uh, 0 0.83. So is that like 17% less kind of thing? Yeah. So it was less. It was not statistically significant by hair, but Jerry doesn't care about statistically right. significant. We're talking about 3,000 patients, though. number needed to treat was 83 for five years for one to do better in terms of events, and 200 for five years for one less death. When they looked at what these people were taking at the end of five years, they were much more likely to be on ACE inhibitors, aspirin, ARBs, drugs to lower blood sugar and blood pressure and lower your lipids. And patients in this group often met target hemoglobin A1Cs, blood pressure, and cholesterol levels. Of the three, clearly, blood pressure is the most, most, most important. So this is a minimal, minimal benefit. Yes, I, that's and right. Did you see that? I wrote, good news for all the diabetics out there, because <laughs> you don't have to do a damn thing. Yes. And, but the, <laughs> you know, and then if you think what actually worked, you know, we know that blood pressure works, and we know we just said lifestyle and exercise works. So this is not a ringing endorsement for cholesterol and sugar. <laughs> no, it's not. No, exactly. We don't want to take the negative point of view here, but I mean, you got to call no, a spade a spade oh, here, absolutely. man. Absolutely. It's important. Number eight, occurrence of acute otitis media during colds in kids younger than four in the Pediatric Infectious Disease Journal from the University of Virginia. They looked at 30 kids who had 31 colds. They looked at the kids when they were well. They did uh, ear exams on them every, like, every three or four hours. When they got the cold, they even did more ear exams on them and basically said, what is the uh, normal evolution in terms of otitis media in the setting of colds? And they found that 15 of the, of the uh, they had, pardon me, they had 31 colds, 17 of the kids got otitis media. So half of them basically. When did they get it? Generally by five days they had it. And um, yeah, there were some differences in the development of otitis media. If you had an effusion at baseline when you were well, all of those kids developed a chronic technically uh, otitis media when they had a cold and much fewer developed it when they, if they did not have baseline uh, effusions. But in any case, they measured viral cultures and the vast majority had positive nasopharyngeal viral cultures. And they said, you know, some six of these kids actually, um, uh, uh, three of these kids wound up going to a doctor by mistake, you know, and they and the doctor gave them antibiotics, as you might anticipate, because they saw this otitis media. Their claim, however, is these are viral infections, and in fact, 12 of the 17 kids who had otitis media never went to the doctor because they didn't, they weren't being bothered by how, it. How do these guys know about them, though? Because they looked every day, every day, every day. They so they made the diagnosis Aren't technically. Aren't these doctors? Aren't these doctors? They made the diagnosis technically, but they're suggesting that this is largely asymptomatic and not a big deal. Yeah, and so I, if you I, go to a doctor, you're going to get our, uh, antibiotics. So I think the really great point, you know, we, we did papers on rhinositis, which said in the old days you used to think, well, if they had something on the x-ray or 
a CT scan, that meant they really of their had that was, of their sinus. That was a gold standard. Then we, they looked in people who had a cold, and they all had little inflammatory changes. This is inflammatory changes in the year due to a cold. It's a viral disease. It doesn't need antibiotics. These were not kids with a fever, by the way. And fever is where we do this, make this overdiagnosis even more because otitis media doesn't typically cause a fever. It's a little abscess. And even in those cases that are believed to be bacterial, the number needed to treat to get a response, which means a little quicker resolution, doesn't mean that uh, you know you're going to get mastoiditis or meningitis. Something like uh, they 15. point out, yeah, one in fifteen people get benefit out um, of antibiotics who have otitis media, and one in five get harm from so from the antibiotics. Itself. So I don't believe this means that if you have real otitis media, that is not a cold, not a fever. Not a two-year-old who you don't know what's going on, you want to give them antibiotics, but a five-year-old who's pulling at her ear and says, that hurts, and you look inside and there's a immobile drum. Um, yeah, you want to give antibiotics. You don't need to give antibiotics, but I, that's perfectly reasonable. The benefit is small, but in that group, it's probably a little higher. The number you treat is probably less because there aren't that many of those. Um, that's reasonable, but in all these others, gosh, we, we way overdiagnose this. Number nine is about nystagmus assessment uh, documented by emergency physicians. This is by Kerber in Academic Emergency Medicine. Uh, I think we can extrapolate to all of us. Um, these are people who came to an emergency department because they complained of dizzy. And somebody, these are all patients who ended up with, um, with uh, concerns about vertigo. And th they reviewed their charts of a thou over 1,000 patients, and they... Um, found out that in many cases they didn't document whether or not there was a nystagmus. And when they did, they didn't document any of the details about the nystagmus so you could tell, because nystagmus gives you clues about what is the cause. And when they did document those clues, the diagnosis often conflicted with what the clues suggested. That's the doctor bashing part. I'm not terribly interested in that. But the uh, reason I, th I picked this paper is because I think it. we all deal with dizzy patients all the time, and it's as horrible as it sometimes feels to do that. In fact, as Marty Samuels uh, always likes to say, he gives this wonderful lecture about it, that if you actually have a, a reasonable approach to what is the differential of dizzy, what does that mean, uh, it's actually fun and relatively easy. So the quick and dirty is that when somebody says they're dizzy, they mean many different things. And we should all know this, that they can mean a sensation of movement, the room spinning, even I'm spinning, but sensation of movement, that's vertigo. Some bad causes, some not so bad causes, some benign causes. They can mean, I don't, I can't find my position in space. That's a cerebellar problem. That's usually a significant problem. That's imbalance ataxia. They can mean, I feel like I'm going to pass out. I really am going to lose consciousness. As you know, near syncope can be bad or it can be not so bad. For all of those, we have a workup. The fourth one is it ain't any of those. They can't really describe exactly. Just sort of funny feeling in my head. Or it's all of them. Whatever you ask them, yes, that's what it is. If it isn't clearly any one of the three, it's not anything to worry about. And that's very common in the elderly to have this sensation of dizzy, but you can't pin it down. Anyway, to get back to this paper, when you're looking for vertigo, um, the stagmus is really helpful. And these authors give a really nice brief description of what you should look for in the nystagmus. And I think this is something we should all be pretty good at. Uh, so they talk about the clues to peripheral vertigo um, nystagmus, unidirectional, fatigable. With the whole uh, te uh, Dick's test, you can bring it out. They talk about what are some things that suggest a central cause, which you better be worried about. Bidirectional, persistent downbeat. Um, uh, they talk about physiologic nystagmus, which is N-gauge only. Oh, the other thing for central is if it changes direction when they change their eyes. They look to the left, fast beat to the left. They look to the right, fast beat to the right. That would be really worrisome. Anyway, I think we, all of us, not all of us, but most of us don't do a very good job with dizzy. And I think we can. We can do much, much better. And this paper, it's a nice reference for some of the clues about that. The only other thing I'll just say is that the other critical thing, of course, in working up these is a good neurologic exam. And this dizziness and nystagmus are not in isolation. There's a whole bunch of other things that can help you decide whether this is peripherally based vertigo or centrally based vertigo. 
in terms of their history, their uh, manifestations of vomiting, nausea, lack of thereof. So th it's not... No, I, but I just think we shouldn't ignore this clue. It's a good clue. And th the most important thing is the neurologic cell. All right, tell us about Number pro 10. battling prostate cancer. Number 10, should we uh, use uh, alpha reductase inhibitors for prostate cancer? This is by Hoffman, not I, a different Hoffman, and Michael Barry from the University of New Mexico in, in JGM. Um, and they may, it's a, it's a discussion of this notion that you should use these five alpha reductase inhibitors um, as chemoprophylaxis. Um, these guys make the following very good points. Screening doesn't accomplish very much. Uh, I would say at most that's true. Uh, we've now reached the point where uh, most authorities are saying we shouldn't be doing screening, and I certainly have been saying that for a long time, or at least we it shouldn't do it routinely. So because screening isn't that good, some people have recommended use of these drugs like finasteride um, because two randomized trials found that there was up to a 25% relative risk reduction in prostate cancer in the patients who got prophylaxis with finasteride. There were no patient-oriented outcomes in those trials these guys mentioned. And in fact, the cancers that they found were all subclinical. They were found on mandated routine biopsy, and that's called surveillance bias. We have a whole paper about surveillance bias later, so I won't go into it now. It's a really important concept. These guys point out there was no difference in cancer identified because of biopsy done for symptoms. This was all surveillance. It was all subclinical. There was a trend toward more high-grade cancers in the finasteride group than in the other group. There was no evidence of any benefit in patient-oriented outcomes. So these guys say it may do more harm than good. I, I think that's absolutely true. Certainly, the only way we can know for sure is if there were a trial which used patient-oriented outcomes as an answer. I do think these drugs, the 5 alpha reductase inhibitors, are, are drugs looking for a disease. Oh, well, actually, uh, they're looking, you, if you take them, you'll grow hair. <laughs> they're, 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 we found a lot of things to use them for. <laughs> but but um, what exactly they do medically, I'm not sure. Okay. All right. I got it. Uh, 11. Hepatitis B and the need for boosters. Do you need to get a booster every 10, 15, 20 years? Nah. Uh, World Health Organization doctors wrote about this, and they said, you know, this stuff works really pretty well in terms of generating immunity. And when we look at uh, anamnestic response uh, based on a stimulus, it's really quite reliable. And so they basically conclude, as has the CDC and some Europeans and Canadians, that you don't need to get a routine booster uh, when you've had hepatitis B. Right. The only, the only exceptions, they would say, are immunocompromised patients. Yeah, they said measure periodically, and if they go below a threshold, which is 10-something or others, and that I think, you can give a booster. And, no, and no I, sweat. And as I've heard you say, um, you can have, uh, if there's a particular reason why in a particular case of the high-risk exposure, et cetera, you want to get one and see where you are and do you need a booster, that that would be fine too. But in for routine use, particularly for healthcare workers, um, you don't need it for many, many years, at least 20 to 30 years. So that's it. Number 12 is another one uh, that we've done recently and been harping on. It's a little soapbox, uh, mostly Rick, but me too, um, called this is an editorial by Arthur Kaplan, uh, the ethicist from University of Pennsylvania, which um, suggests that it's time to mandate flu vaccine in healthcare workers. It goes over many of the points we've talked about before, that when we don't mandate it, less than 50% of healthcare workers actually get vaccinated, that when you do vaccinate healthcare workers, patients benefit and when you don't patients uh, suffer and i you know we shouldn't be arguing about whether or not we should have the individual right be free not to do something if it causes harm to patients we um, we there are many things that we're mandated to do like tb testing or you know um, i think the better example is rubella if you're going to work in a nursery you can't you can't be rubella exposed so um so th this is, you know, we should just do this. There are some places that have done this. Uh, Virginia Mason, I think the Mayo has done it as well. Yeah, there's a bunch of places, actually. And uh, they go from 50% to 98 99%. And it works. And, you know, there's one person out of 2,000 who makes a big fuss. But basically, it's not a big deal. We should do this. I agree. 
number 13. Yeah, this is a case against uh, testing, genetic testing, BRCA1 and 2 testing for breast cancer. This is by Lynn in the journal Surgery from UCSF. These authors argue that there are thousands of BRCA variants. They predict generally predict risk unreliably, always less well than just a simple family history. And therefore, they conclude that BRCA testing is expensive. By the way, it's $3,000 might be out of pocket if it's done for screening. Expensive way of determining what could be accomplished more expeditiously by speaking with your patient. No. Now, that's a pretty dramatic statement. Um, you know, I've always been a little confused on this, and I called Mike Wilkes, my good buddy, and he really explained it to me, so I think I understand it now, and I'm going to try to explain it as well. So these, a lot of these facts I'd known, but I hadn't really ever put them together very well. Um, genetic cancers exist, but they're, they're, um, they're less than 10% of all breast cancers. So most breast cancer is sporadic. It has nothing to do with genetic testing. Doing genetic testing in general has nothing to do with that. Of the ones that are genetic, only about 30% of them are identifiable by these BRCA locuses. So it does exist, but it's only a very, very, very small portion. So then if you think about it, when would it make sense to do it? So if, for example, you have a high genetic risk family, there's been multiple cases, not just breast, could be prostate, ovarian, et cetera, a high risk family, and the an index case gets tested who has cancer, you test that if it's not BRCA related, okay, it still could be genetic, probably is genetic in that family. Um, testing the rest of the family members is useless. It's not BRCA related. If, on the other hand, that the, uh, the index case is positive at a specific locus, then testing the family members is reasonable because now you can tell them for sure whether they are BRCA positive at that same locus. And if they're not, if this is one of those small number of genetic cancers that is BRCA related, you can give tremendous reassurance. Yes, your mom has that, but you don't. Or you can tell them they're now at very, very high risk because they only have a genetic um, family history, but they are positive at that locus, and they can use that to help try to make decisions about prophylaxis, etc. Testing other people just in the blind is crazy. You're not going to find anything. It's not going to be terribly meaningful. And so th I think there is a reasonable way to do this test in a very restricted way in a very small number of patients where it can be useful, even though it's very expensive. Well, I'm glad you understand it. <laughs> like, uh, with Mike, I'm uh, clueless. No, I, I think uh, that all makes very sense to me, and um, I thank Mike a lot for explaining it. Fourteen is uh, frank words about breast screening. Frank words. Uh, is this mine as well? No. Oh, okay. This is in open medicine. What I don't. What is that? Open medicine. Open medicine is, is uh, closed medicine. No, is it's like know. floss. It's one of the uh, online uh, journals that. Um, you, so you you may have to pay to publish your work in it, but you don't have to pay to read it. Um, it's so a really from, important concept. Yes, it is. University of Toronto, uh, they point out that uh, this debate between mammography in the 39 to 49 year old age group is um, is problematic, and, and so they're going to basically say, here's what the public U.S. Public Health Services Task Force said, which is, Mark Ebell now is on that. He's just congratulations, Mark. That's yeah. very cool. Yes. Do the right thing. I know you will. Um, he said, they said, 1,904 women had to be tested, have a mammogram every year for 10 years to prevent one death from breast cancer. In the, in the next group up, to put it in perspective, the 50 to 59, it's 1,339. And the next group up, wow, there's a big change there. In the people 60 to 69, you only have to do this 377 people. So big, big, big change in that subset. But, I, you know, is 377 good enough? I mean, the notion that they got slammed for saying you should talk to women about it instead of just recommend it for the 1900, why shouldn't you talk to women for the 377? You know, 376 out of <laughs> this group of 307 get no benefit. Do you want to do it? Well, that's going to—that's the conclusion of the paper. But the, the, obviously, they're talking no, about so the, obviously, the lowest risk. No, I'm, I'm, I understand, but you, the irony is that they, the public health service got slammed for for not saying you must do it in the the, the lowest risk group, whereas actually they should be saying talk about it in the highest. I risk agree. Group. I agree. Oh, listen, I got this. 
John Hickner. John, thanks very much. This is the family. Have you seen? Yes, I have. They I get have. lots of people there, John. <laughs> very good. I, I get I get the uh, report every year. And uh, Val. Yes. Hi, yeah. hi guys. You, Cleveland Clinic. They have the, they have a beautiful family, and they do. I've met a lot of them, and they're they're really lovely. Well, we met all these people when they were all at Michigan State, but now none of them are at Michigan <laughs> State anymore. John's a uh, head of family practice at Cleveland Clinic, and yes. Mark's at. University Georgia. of Georgia, Georgia. Georgia. down there, Georgia. someplace, yeah. yeah. In any case. And Henry Barry's in, uh, Henry's still there, but uh, Howard Brody's in Texas. They've, they've moved all over. In any case, they're talking about overdiagnosis, one of Jerry's favorite, favorite concepts. Cancers that are diagnosed but will not kill you. And they said up to 25% of breast cancers may be in this category. So they basically say liberal screening increases the risk of overdiagnosis and exposes many women to the substantial harms of screening that may, um, rather than saving a life or, or, or two. They basically point out that 30 European countries sh have shown that there is a market decrease in the mortality from breast cancer, particularly in this group of people who are less likely to be screened, the, the, uh, the 39 to 49 year olds. They said that there's a 37% decrease in mortality. They also say that in the people who are more likely to be screened, the mortality decrease is actually only around 20%. They say that they're concerned that uh, certain societies that are kind of pushing for this uh, earlier mammography may be being influenced by manufacturers who make the machines and those kinds of things. I don't want to specifically mention any names. Yeah, but <laughs> names. the huge, huge conflict of interest. <laughs> this is a terrific, terrific paper. And um, and yeah, as you say, the, this concept of overdiagnosis is really, really critical. When again, I'll mention Gil Welch and colleagues' book. Uh, from Dartmouth uh, called Overdiagnosis. I recommend it to everybody, even Rick, although I know he won't read a book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Just tell me the answer. We and I do want to say, uh, I don't want to uh, slight any of our old friends from uh, Michigan State. So Mindy, hi, Mindy, and Bill Wadlin. Um, there was a whole group that, uh, that we got to know and um, really enjoyed getting to know. Mindy Smith. Gary Frenchick. Was Gary, uh, Gary was not in the family. He was internal medicine. Yes, he's medicine. Internal that's medicine. right. Okay. 15 is yours, Jerome. 15, adherence to cancer prevention guidelines decreases mortality. That sounds good. This is my McCulloch Cancer Epidemiology. Well, let me, let me straighten out. The idea is the cancer guidelines are going to prevent you from getting cancer. These people say the cancer guidelines will pre prevent you from dying from anything. So this is a 14-year follow-up on a prospective co cohort of 112,000 people. Now, every one of these wasn't was a non-smoker, so they're not looking at smoking. Smoking has a big effect. We all know that if we could get our patients to stop smoking, that would be the biggest thing we could do. But they're looking at other healthy lifestyle things like diet and exercise. And... Um, so they looked at diet and exercise over this long period in this huge bunch of non, uh, uh, non-smokers, and the overall decrease in mortality was a relative risk of 40%. So not only did they not get cancer, they didn't was, get other things. There was a 50% decrease in cancer, 30% uh, decrease in cancer mortality, 40% decrease in overall mortality if you compare the highest scoring groups versus the lowest scoring groups. If you did everything versus you did none of them. You're really fat and you didn't exercise at all versus you did everything that they suggested. So it's not just the A1C like we talked about before, which really is meaningless, but you know, I remember many years ago at one of when the Heart Association published one of its ACLS manuals, you know, 7,000 pages, and I made the complaint that there was in these 7,000 pages of all these fancy medicines, there was nothing about lifestyle. And I was sent a letter by higher ups who chastised me and noted that on page 448 there was a paragraph. <laughs> so, um, you know, as Rick says, it's it's harder to exercise than it is to take a pill. I wish there was a pill for it. <laughs> I'm going to give you an exercise pill. It makes you jump around. Well, I know what that is. But, um, you know, it's pretty powerful stuff. It's amazing. I mean, imagine if you had a drug which decreased mortality by 40%. I love it. And you'd, somebody would be selling it, I can tell you. 16, four common types of bursitis, diagnosis and management. Can we change this to two, for the sake of the tape since you can't get everything in a Jerry, we don't do abstract. tapes anymore. Tapes went out like 20 years ago. <laughs> Can we do two this types digital. of... digital. The two important types of mortality and forget the other two. <laughs> 
four orthopedists wrote this, and they're talking about four, got, four kinds. We, each, <laughs> each guy got a got a. You know, we don't do uh, reviews very often, but I wanted to do this because this is the type of thing that we deal with every day, and yet we don't. Bursitis. We don't. Yeah, we don't. We don't talk about it very much because it isn't. There aren't a lot of studies about it, so I think it's useful to do one of these reviews once in a while, and I think this one is pretty good. Um, although two of the four, I think, are less important. So basically, one of the things we try to do is distinguish whether they're infected or not. That's well, which four are they? First, tell us. Oh, okay. Prepateller. Yeah. So Electron. That, that's our favorite. Well, so those are the two big ones. Electron is very, very common. Prepateller, nursemaid's knee, is um, housemaid's knee is the one okay. that's the most dangerous. Knee. Housemaid's knee. And trochanteric, which is you know out of lateral aspect of the hip. And one I never heard of, retrocalcaneal bursitis. Retro behind the calcaneus. It's between the calcaneus and the Achilles tendon. Yeah, it's anyway. A, yeah, I've, I've actually seen it. I've seen it, but it's not very common. In any case, the idea here is, is this infected or is it not? So it's, That's it's the key warm, question. red, uh, tender, work, worse when you you know stretch it. That's probably. And if you're in, in question, you know, stick a needle in it. See if pus come out, you know, do a culture, that kind of thing. If it's infected, you can give them some antibiotics. They don't mention which ones, but I think that these are generally gram positives that you're, Same you're you trying to get. Same you do for a joint. And, um, yeah, so, you know, you can you can needle it when they talk about, um, what are the ones that I think? Oh, basically they talk about, you know, a little well, shot, so, shot of steroids maybe. Yeah, I don't think that that's important. I, I To me, the, the critical thing is that, you know, we're always trying to diagnose, differentiate what's in the joint and what's overlying the joint. And for bursitis, you often have that differential. And it can be hard, but the good thing to remember is that jo when the joint's involved, it hurts when you move the joint. When it's something overlying it, it only hurts when you move in one particular direction at extremes. So, for example, with with uh, nursemaid's knee, housemaid's knee, excuse me, um, if you if you the knee's full range of motion, no problem until you get to really extremes of flexion. That's when you're most stretching the bursa. That's when they have pain. So that's a useful tip. Remember that uh, this one in the elbow is very, very, very common. It's almost never infected. Unless you're really worried, I don't think you have to tap that. The well, I think it's fun to tap it. But Get then, that yellow stuff out of there. A patient the, thinks you're a big hero. The knee on the other yeah, it's easy. So you want to do it, you can. But the knee is one where I'd be very cautious because that's where all the infected bursas are, is, is, is pre-patellar. And, um, and so unless you're really sure... It's a reasonable place to just just tap it, and because if it is infected, you really do want to use uh, antibiotics. Good idea. Yeah. Seventeen. Podiatry. Effective, effectiveness of multifaceted podiatry. Uh, podiat, podiatry. Po podiatric. Inter intervention. Podiatric intervention. To prevent falls in community dwelling older people with disabling foot pain. Here's the key here: disabling foot pain, which is not the vast majority of people. The elderly, honestly, are afraid of falling. There's a lot of serious injuries they can get from falling. Even if you don't break a bone, you get nasty lacerations. And um, the hospitals now are being required to screen people to see whether they're prone to falls. Not, not that those programs, frankly, work very well. And there's honestly not a heck of a lot you can do about it. But the hospitals still have to do this. But in any case. But it would be really important if you could find some way to do something. Yes. This is critical, especially, you know, they fall and break their hip. That's a big deal. Australian study of 305 people, average age six, uh, 74, with disabling foot pain, catch that, and risk factors for falling. And they randomized them to a multifaceted podiatry uh, intervention versus usual care. What was this intervention? And I think you'll find that this intervention was certainly not very aggressive at all. And that's why I think one of the results were so so poor. But in any case, provision of customized orthoses. The podiatrists really love those little suckers. I'd love to see a double-blind trial of orthoses or not. Anyway, evaluation to determine whether they were using any inappropriate footwear, provision of a voucher so that you could buy appropriate footwear, instructions in a home-based foot and exercise program, whether you did it or not is another matter, and giving them a booklet, and whether you read it or not. I mean, this is really a, a minimal, very front-end loaded kind but of But that's good, because, because when you take these very complicated programs, nobody's ever going to do them. So this is Well, good. we don't know if they did this one, except they gave them nice, some well, nice shoes. Well, that's pretty good. They gave them the money for the shoes. That's good. I like it. Um, no, there was a significant reduction in the mean number of falls per participant, but there was no uh, significant difference. And the number difference. needed to treat was three. 
no significant difference between the groups and the experiencing at least one fall. I thought these numbers are pretty impressive. 40% of these people fell within one year and about 15, 20% fell multiple times within a year. When they looked at fractures, one out of 153 in the intervention group versus seven out of 150 yeah, so in the that uh, sounds great, except they don't tell us what kind of fractures. We, it, it really matters if they were hip fractures. And or they were. And th this number was not statistically significant. So whether it happened by chance alone, we don't know. That, but that's one versus seven. That's pretty good. But uh, I mean, I doubt that that was. And they also chance. talked about compliance. About a lot of the people who got these fancy shoes didn't wear them. So there are a couple of. I think this is a really could be an important study. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite make it because this is a really important topic. And if it really worked with this little intervention, it would be terrific because we could all do this. This is not doesn't take a lot of, you know, we had seven meetings and 12 classes and all that stuff. Um, it would really, it would, imagine if you could save hip fractures by giving them money for a decent shoe. That would be fabulous. Put in the front end, save an enormous amount of money. Now, whose money is it? A lot of people aren't going to spend it, but a Kaiser would spend it. There are way this would be really, really important. The problem is they don't describe what are these fractures. That really matters. Trivial fractures don't matter. Big fractures do matter. And the, the evaluation was not blinded in any way. And there are ways in which you can that can really distort the results. So I don't think this was failure, but it, unfortunately, I don't think it proves how good it was. I, it's You're a great, taking a very charitable point of view. It's a great idea, and it's really important. Can you move your thing up a little bit? I can. Number. Wait a minute. Let me push a button here, Chief. Number 18. This is a paper Rick will love because it says the wackiest thing. <laughs> this is um, acetaminophen versus diclofenac for ankle sprain. This is by Lirtzis in Foot and Ankle International, which I read religiously. Uh, this is from Greece. Now, I picked this paper. I did, even though it's a little wacky. And even though it, the bottom line is the right answer, but, but... Any paper that says paracetamol is as good as or better than an NSAID, you love, no matter yes. what the heck. So I, I believe that we way overuse NSAIDs and that we don't understand that paracetamol is just as good or acetaminophen, either one. And that, um, and that there are only, the only... That's not always true. There are three conditions that I always point out where we should be using an NSAID. One is colic either biliary or renal. Two is rheumatoid disease, no surprise there. And three is menstrual cramp. Those are all prostaglandin-mediated. And there, NSAIDs have special anti-inflammatory effects above and beyond analgesic effects. For analgesia, there's no difference between these two different classes of drugs. And since acetaminophen is far safer, it's the one I think we should be using, particularly in the elderly. And as we know, there are real big consequences of using lots and lots and lots of NSAIDs. We're going to talk a little bit later about another one with drug interactions with quinolones. But um, so uh, I'm, you know, I, I really don't think we should be using NSAIDs nearly as much Would as you we want do. To tell us about this paper? And there have been many, many papers which compare for everything besides those three conditions where they show that there's no difference in an NSAID and APAP. So here's one where ankle sprain, well, everybody, you know, residents always go like, yeah, of course you need an, an anti-inflammatory. It's an ankle sprain. It's swollen. It's, And here they compared a teeny dose of acetaminophen, 500 milligrams TID, that's almost homeopathic, with 75 milligrams of diclofenac. And it was double blind. And they did all the other usual stuff that you do with an ankle sprain. And I wouldn't have been surprised. In fact, I would have expected that the acetaminophen was as good, although with this little tiny dose, maybe it wouldn't be quite as good. But in this study, it actually was better. There was less swelling with the acetaminophen, equal amount of pain. Well, actually, the, normally these studies only talk about pain. This one talked about swelling, and <laughs> somehow, some we have no idea how. It did find much less adverse effects, that I expect as well. So I, I don't think it causes less swelling. I think that's probably a little strange and probably just by chance in this study. But the bottom line answer I think is correct, which is that we shouldn't be, just because it's called Achilles tendonitis, there's evidence that in Achilles tendonitis, itis, inflammation, acetaminophen is just as good. And in back pain and in headache and in fractures and in ankle sprains, it's just as good. I wouldn't say it's better. It's just as good. But if you're going to use it, by the way, don't use 500 TID. Use 20 per kilo for per dose. 
Uh, that's uh, not the package insert, Doctor. You are you are going over uh, what yeah. it says. I don't. I some people say I don't know who, yeah, but there are people you know, who might say that. All right, let's see what we got here. Uh, 19. Oh, speaking of which, Quinlone's review of psychiatric and neurologic adverse reactions. Uh, this is entitled. This is in drug safety. Uh, this is from the town of Sintra in it, Portugal, and I know you've been there many times, Rick. Many times, Rick. This is a beautiful, this is a magical little town, about 15 miles from, I think it's about 15 miles from um, Lisbon, and this, ta- it's it's gorgeous. It is spectacularly beautiful little town. Okay. Okay. You, you should go there sometimes. It's wonderful. In any case, I've if you go onto once. the internet, there's a bajillion people, or a, a goodly number, who think that they have really been screwed up neurologically as a result of the quinolones. And there's a, there's a big under this this um, undercurrent here. So this guy looked at, catch this, this paper has 127 references. This fi- fellow found 83 published articles describing 145 case reports involving 206 neurologic problems. 50% of them had what they called psychiatric disorders, mania, behavioral, behavioral mania, manifestations. insomnia, psychosis, and delirium. And the other half had seizures, yeah, that's good, confusion, and myoclonus. These uh, symptoms came on within minutes or, or days of start, starting the drug. There was also a, a sense that if you took quinolones plus other drugs that you might make this these things come on more likely. They talked about theophylline, NSAIDs, antivirals, opiates, antidepressants, etc. And they also suggest, you know, it's hard to say, this is a bunch of case studies, uh, prior history of seizures, electrolyte disturbances, renal or hepatic failure, older age, less, more higher doses may have something to do with this. But the fact is, there are neurologic effects associated with these drugs. There's also a black box for the tendinopathy. I think you got to be careful. The, the idea of using these drugs for bronchitis is a mistake. Yeah, and you know we've done papers which say that w- we as physicians, when we hear about drug interactions, the patient says, I think it might be that medicine I got. We tend to poo-poo it. We say, nah, that's not related to that medicine. Especially if it doesn't make sense. Like, so, I, okay, if it's so diarrhea, we, I understand from the antibiotic, but going crazy? So with this, the things we haven't heard about, we, we tend to we say, no, that has nothing to do with a quinolone. Right. And so I'm sure that these 145 cases are way the tip of the iceberg. There's got to be, this is a real real thing and it's important for us to know about it 20 harm from NSAIDs oh my god we have a theme here in patients with hypertension and coronary disease by Bavri in the American Journal of Medicine University of Florida this isn't anything new is it it's a postdoc analysis of uh, NSAID use in 21,000 subjects who will had already been on a calcium channel blocker because they were in a hypertension study. And then they asked them, you know, have you ever used it? Do you use it now, et cetera? And they broke them up into chronic users, intermittent users, and never users. And chronic use was associated with significant increases. And I mean that not statistically, but clinically. It has a ratio of 1.5, 50% more due to cardiovascular deaths. And actually, cardiovascular was even higher than that. Uh, there's lots of problems with potential misclassification bias and association versus cause. But um, where there's smoke, this is one where, at the very least, you know, it's concerning. And there have been many, many other papers like this. And again, I would suggest that we use NSAIDs mostly in the elderly or at least a lot in the elderly, who are at the most at risk, especially renal disease, et cetera, um, when we don't need to. It's, I don't mean to claim that NSAIDs are bad drugs, because they're not. They're really good, they're, and they're mostly pretty safe. But they're not as safe as the other guy by a long shot, and they're not better in the vast majority of things we use them for. So, again, that's why I'm on that soapbox. We know you hate the NSAIDs, <laughs> and we know you're being paid <laughs> off by... McNeil Laboratories. <laughs> we know that, Jerry. Yeah. You can't hide All that. right, all right. Me a call. I got, I got, uh, uh, 21. 21. Hold on here, Chief. Oh, it's an important paper. Reports of eligibility criteria of randomized trials. I won't read the rest of it. Yeah, this is by Blumley uh, from Freiburg in Germany in the British Medical Journal. Really important paper to tell us. So uh, they basically, at this 
one hospital in Germany over the last, uh, between 2000 and 2006, they looked at protocols for studies that were, were submitted to it. There were, there were 52 trial protocols. And in the, in the protocol, they basically specified, here's who we're going to study. Here's who we're, go who we're going to include. Here's who we're going to exclude. What these authors then did was uh, they looked at the initial protocols and they looked at 78 papers that were published reflecting the results of these trials. And they said, in these pap published papers, uh, what did you tell us about the uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria for this study? Because that determines who you're going to extrapolate it to. it's used to. Exactly. So they basically found of the 52, that 52 of the 52, the paper that dis explained the study and its results in some way screwed up the uh, uh, elaboration of the uh, uh, <laughs> I, th I don't think you're being very clear. The paper reported something different than they actually did. We know they did it differently because that's what they said. Here's what we're doing. And then when they reported it, they reported it as though it were different. Newly added criteria were noted for 21 of the 52. Modified criteria occurred in 85% of the cases. And as a result of this, failure to accurately report algebra criteria eligibility criteria broaden the application of the trial results but it really shouldn't have because they weren't the people who were studied right so let's give some examples and, and it's in both directions I think this is really really important so you have a, 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 a group where you um, where you're giving a drug and you're it, it works a little, but it also causes harm. Mm -hmm. The common benefit is, is close. So it really is only advantageous in very sick patients. So if you have the patients where the absolute um, benefit is pretty high, the relative ben benefit is the same, but the absolute's high because the risk is high, benefit outweighs harm. But there's only a few people who are really sick. So you don't want the readers to use the drug only in that small group. You want them to use it in everybody. But in the less sick patients, it's not so good. So in your protocol, you only study the really sick patients. That's where benefit's greater than harm. But in the paper, you forget to say, oh, we excluded all the moderate patients. So now the reader thinks, oh, it's in everybody. Let me give you an example. The CURE trial, they gave uh, clopidogrel to everybody who had rule out coronary syndrome, and it didn't work. So they changed the protocol, and they said, we're only going to give it to people who already have a troponin leak because it caused some benefit and some harm. In the troponin leak people, it was it had some ultimate benefit. In all the others, it didn't. Now, if they want to sell you clopidogrel, they don't want you to use it only somebody with a troponin leak. There aren't that many of them. So if if, in fact, they didn't do this in that paper, but if, in fact, they had forgotten to tell us that they were only including troponin leaks, that would be very distorting. If they told us, we did it in everybody with chest pain, because in everybody with chest pain, it doesn't work. So by omitting an exclusion cri a criteria, you make it look like the drug is useful in many more people than it is. What about in the other direction? So sometimes there were um, there was some new criteria that was never there. And here's another great example. Supposing you give a drug to um, to 100 people, and it doesn't work. It doesn't work. You don't want to report that. But you then go back and you look and you say, let's see who was born on Monday. The people who were born on Monday didn't work. People born on Tuesday didn't work. People born on Wednesday, it was a little better. Thursday, not so good. Let's report this study as though we did it only in people born on Wednesday. Now it's positive. Now, if you report it instead, as we gave it to everybody, we did a post hoc subgroup analysis and we found that Wednesday's good, everybody would say, that's not, doesn't mean anything. It didn't work on Thursday and Tuesday. So instead, you just report on Wednesday as though you only did it on Wednesday. It allows you to claim the group drug was good, even though it wasn't. This didn't occur sometimes. It didn't occur a lot of the times. It occurred in 100% of these papers. Although it was one wacky institution. One in institution, although we've done other studies which say that when you go to gov, clin, uh, gov, registry government.com, uh, <laughs> clinicaltrials.gov, where they look at what was the protocol versus what was published, it's the exact same thing. Not at one institution. And there's nothing you can do about it because you're not going to go back and look at the protocol. You're just going to read the report. So this is very, very 
worrisome, and it really does make it even more important for us to be so skeptical. 22 is another reason to be skeptical. This is about effect size of biomarkers by John Ioannidis. We've done a bunch of his papers. Fabulous, smart guy. This was in JAMA. Um, and they looked at a whole bunch of different biomarkers in studies, and they said, let's look at the studies where it was reported in the New England Journal and JAMA and uh, journals like that, big-time journals, and where it got cited over and over and over again. When does it get cited? When it's in the big journal. Let's see how that did in those studies compared to when it's published in other the same biomarker in other smaller journals and never get cited in the literature. And let's actually look at meta-analyses, which looks at all of the stuff and see how they all compare. And what they found quite simply was the journals, the ones that were published in the big journals that always got cited, that's how it works, almost always had by far the best effect. They were the effect size, the benefit of the biomarker was much better than in the meta-analysis where they looked at what happened in all the trials that was done. It was also much better than in the biggest single study. So imagine you have a study with 100 patients and you have another study with 1,000 patients. Which one do you think is more trustworthy? Obviously the one with 1,000 patients. But it's also likely to be less positive. So it doesn't go in the New England Journal. It goes in some obscure journal. Almost always, the one in the big journal wasn't the big trial, the definitive trial. It was the most positive trial. And not only is it that the New England Journal wants to publish the most positive trial because they want to have breakthrough stuff and because they want to sell reprints, but the manufacturer wants to publish it, the big one, the best, the best result wants to publish in the best, in the biggest journal, the one that's going to get cited. And what's worse than all of that is that once it's in the New England Journal, we all act as though that's the only evidence. We ignore the most important trial, the biggest trial. We ignore the meta-analysis, and we cite the big, important study in the big, important journal, which, surprisingly enough, is always the most positive. It's powerful stuff. <laughs> 23 is about surveillance bias in outcome reporting. This is by Holt in uh, uh, JAMA from Johns Hopkins. Um, it uses uh, deep venous thrombosis as an example of the more you look, the more you find, which they call surveillance bias. And this they talk of as a non-random type of information bias. This occurs when we do screening, when you're looking where there is no sign of disease, but they also talk about how it occurs when we're not doing classical screening for cancer, for example, but when you do hip surgery and you say, well, instead of waiting to see how many people have symptoms, we'll do an ultrasound every three days because we know that they could have a, a clot. Let's do an ultrasound every three days. And now guess what happens? The more you look, the more you find. So you find all sorts of DVTs. And, but unfortunately, we don't know what those DVTs mean because they're probably very different than symptomatic DVTs. We're going to be talking about this with pulmonary embolism later. Later, excuse me. But um, this this concept of looking in people without symptoms and finding things is what they call surveillance bias, and it leads to lots and lots and lots of confusion about what what the disease is. Now, these guys stress the public health aspects of this, the dangers, because they say, well, let's suppose that you get penalized. You don't get paid as much if when you do hip surgery, you, you have a lot of DVTs. So what do you think you're going to do? Stop looking. Stop looking. I didn't have DVTs. So you look, you're going to see a lot more. I think that's really true, but I'm worried about the flip side. I'm worried about Overdiagnosis. When we see all these papers which find all this disease that we never would have known about it unless we looked because of the study, it's a different disease than the thing we're looking at. And again, I've mentioned before, and I've mentioned several times, I think even on this tape, Gil Welch's book, Overdiagnosed, terrific, terrific book. It goes into this. This is going to get worse and worse. The more screening we do, the more routine testing we do, and the more we do it with big-time, very high-end, modern technology. When we have an electron microscope to look inside of our blood vessels, we're all going to be having clots all the time because clotting is a normal part of living. But it won't be clotting the way we know it. When we say pulmonary embolism, it won't mean a pulmonary embolism. 
It'll mean something else, but it'll get the same name because it's a clot in the vessel. And that's really, really, really dangerous. Um, one of my former fellows and residents, Kelly O'Loughlin, has just written a fabulous paper about this. We're looking at um, at just random CT scans of the head. You find, quote, herniation, signs of herniation in all sorts of people who are normal clinically. Now, maybe that's radiographic herniation, but that isn't herniation like you and I know it. So w this surveillance bias is a really, really dangerous thing that's going to get only worse in the future. We have to all be aware of it. Good point, Jerry. 24 is entitled Hospital Mortality Length of Stay and Preventable Complications Among Critically Ill Patients After and Before the Installation of One of These Tele-ICU Systems. These guys in the preamble say most of the time these systems are put into rural or community hospitals. How would it work in a university hospital? This is University of Massachusetts. They stuck it into seven of their ERs. These are is a huge, you know, medical center complex kind of thing. They looked at uh, 6,300 adults uh, be, before and after. And one of the problems with this paper is it's not just that they installed uh, telemedicine. They also did all kinds of protocols to in, ensure that the uh, guidelines were established and met and all kinds of other things. So I think that this kind of blurs the picture a little bit, but the fact is the outcomes were uh, terrific. They looked at ICU mortality before the system was put in, 10.7, 8.6 after, it's, a, it's like a 20% reduction. They looked at total mortality, they got a similar uh, reduction, 13.6 versus 11.8. That's a it's, that, that's big time. When they looked at ICU length of stay, decreased the length of stay by two days from six and a half to four and a half. And when they looked at total length of stay in the hospital, it went down three and a half days, which is a, an eternity in, in uh, hospital um, uh, metrics. They said that we did a lot more best practices when we installed this, but the fact of the matter is that that's kind of the part of the study that kind of is, they, 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 it was not just about telemetry. And, of, and we did a paper last month which said beware before and after studies because it isn't because a lot of things are changing, not just the thing you think you're measuring. But this, the, the thing about this paper that I really like is the outcomes were remarkable. So whether it be it's, it's telemetry plus this other stuff, read this paper. They'll tell you a lot of stuff that they did. But in any case... No, but I think that's a critical point that you're making, Rick, and it's not as simple as that's good because what it what it really may be is that when you pay attention to the, these things you do a better job it may have nothing to do with any of these details it's just they paid attention they were really enthusiastic they worked at it so it's you know what is it that we have to do to do as well i don't know the other thing is that normally these places have got lots of residents um but they said and check this out 98% of about 25,000 interventions that affected the diagnostic or therapeutic plan were done by these off-site tele telemetry doctors. So what were the doctors doing who were there in the ER, uh, in, in, the, in the ICU, if 98% of these well, interventions were gen generated assume, by these guys? I assume these were rural hospitals and... No, no, university... University. No, the university is the one that did the telemedicine. Not the, the, I think they did it for a, a smaller hospital. Mm -mm. This was in seven ICUs in the University of Massachusetts. They have two in hospitals. In their system. Big hospitals, 800-bed oh, hospitals. Okay. One of the things I was really kind of surprised about is they say okay, nothing. Right. Yeah, you're right. They say nothing about the money. Yeah, that's the thing. The other point I wanted to make is what cost, how much time, how much money? I mean, you think you, if you're going to save three and a half days in the hospital, that's huge. But, you know, w there has to be cost on the other side of this, too. Yeah. 25 is entitled, Examining the Evidence, the Systematic Review of the Inclusion and Analysis of Older Adults in Randomized Controlled Trials. So this is the same thing that we have been talking about. Um, but it's it's a little slightly different slant. They did looked at five, 109 randomized trials in five journals and they found not only that the elderly were excluded and you can give us some of the the numbers but also that they i think one of the interesting things they failed to report on many things that are outcomes that are really important to the elderly like quality of life and health status and falls so that it's not just they didn't include elderly they didn't include outcomes relevant to the elderly so the basic premise is that we need to include the elderly in clinical studies 
and that they are routinely systematically excluded one way or the other. And they also were excluded, they excluded all these confounders that are very prevalent in the elderly, comorbidities, renal failure, et cetera. And we wouldn't care about that, except the idea is that we would extrapolate to the elderly the results of the clinical trials in yes. younger patients with less comorbidities, yeah. et cetera. So, uh, you know, without going into all the details, they go, it's not just that they, they have age exclusions, but even when they include the elderly, it's not representative elderly. Yeah, when they include the elderly, they found in half the cases, although they did not specify an upper limit in the trial, the eligibility criteria would have systematically excluded the elderly because of the comorbidities that they had. Right. <laughs> so this and you can be any danger. age, but anybody who's been breathed for more than forty-seven years is excluded. Age-specific sp subgroup analyses only occurred in forty percent of the trials. Only sixteen percent of the studies noted that the age-related analyses were exploratory in nature and were under or were underpowered. And, and what's more, because they excluded the representative elderly, even if they did it, uh, let's look at what happened to the 80-year-olds. Those 80-year-olds are not representative. Because they... Because uh, they don't have comorbidity. Exactly, they, exactly, exactly. So the, the, the theme is there it's over and over and over again. Paper, good paper. Number 26, uh, antibiotic use uh, following ambulatory asthma visits by Paul in the journal Pediatrics from Hershey, Pennsylvania. It's NAMSI's database, 5,200 visits to the office or to an emergency department for asthma only. The ICD-9 code said asthma. It didn't say anything about infection. Now, maybe there's some misclassification there, but they didn't have pneumonia. And uh, despite that, one out of six got an antibiotic, mostly a Z-pack, mostly macrolides. Um, and they go through some other things that I don't think are terribly useful and don't make a lot of sense. But this is just a reminder. You know, we're preaching to the choir, but asthma does not treat, get treated with antibiotics. Well, it does get treated with antibiotics. That's the problem. <laughs> it shouldn't be. 27, inhaler mishandling remains common in real life and is associated with reduced disease control. Okay. I don't, I don't think we that's it. That's good. I like that. This is in our respiratory medicine, the Italian study, 2,300 observations of inhaler technique performed in 1,600 regular inhaler users. The thing that's kind of unique in the study is that the average age is 62. These people largely had COPD rather than asthma. But in any case, they think that there was a critical technique error when the, with the use of an MDI in one in eight cases. And more interestingly, they said that there was a critical uh, error in the use of these dry powder inhalers, which are, I thought were created so that you, could, you couldn't screw it up. In about 40% of the cases, they said there was a critical error in how people puffed on their dry powder inhalers. I'm not sure what they mean by critical. Only one-third of the patients reported receiving a practical demonstration of inhaler by a healthcare provider, which is, which is absolutely nutty. But and, typical. And then at the end, they said... Those people who did not use these things properly, that there was an association between not using it properly and ER visits, hospitalizations, antibiotic use, and the administration of steroids, with the implication being they weren't getting their medicines yeah. through these inhalers, and so other things wound up happening. I think that's all right. Unfortunately, the, um, the results were reported only as odds ratio and p-values, so there's no way to know the effect size. Was this important differences or just statistical differences? Still, it, it makes no sense that we give them these things and we don't show them how to use them. The, uh, I went on to the uh, drugstore.com, the, you know, the dry powder inhaler. I looked at Advair. The cost of that thing <laughs> ranges between $100 and $300, depending on the dose of the subuterol. And, so you uh, can't screw it up. Uh, $300 for an inhaler, which you are using improperly, at least according to these guys. Anyway, I think that doctors need to, have the, to demonstrate this. Well, they should monitor how the patients do it. Every paper says so I've, you know, this is an issue. So, and I actually, on our website, you have me doing a demonstration, or you can look at a video of Cheech and Chong doing a demonstration of how to do an inhaler. Um, 28 is misuse of inhalers, and it's more of the same. This is from uh, General, Journal of General Internal Medicine by Press. This is a slightly different version of it. They watched 100 patients. Uh, using their inhaler or one of these devices, and they got a lot of the steps wrong. Um, after they gave them a brief training, they got all the steps right. 
most of the steps don't matter, but it does matter that you time the inhalation with your um, with the activation of the so device. Some steps are critical, and some steps yeah. are not. So some probably matter, and um, you know, again, this is something that should be a no-brainer. We should just do it. Twenty-nine. Stopping sno smoking um, pre-op. Should you do it, or this is, is it this dangerous? Is kind of a nutty. Well, actually, it's a, it tries to correct a nutty notion. So there have been a couple of papers which claim that, well, if you quit, you stop coughing, and therefore you get more post-op pneumonia. What a theory. So these guys did a meta-analysis of nine studies, not big ones, and they found that, of course, that was not true. There was no harm, and in fact, there was a suggestion of benefit if you stop early uh, if rather than wait till the last minute. And certainly we should not... <laughs> give our patients an excuse not to smoke stop more. <laughs> that way you'll cough a lot, and then we'll know you're sick. <laughs> It'll prevent the, the pneumonia. So postoperative. Thirty, placebo effects and the common cold. Yeah, this is a terrific paper by Bruce Barrett. I, just a really nice. Annals, paper. Annals of Family Medicine, University of Wisconsin, seven hundred nineteen people, age eighteen to twelve to eighty with colds. They were enrolled within 36 hours of the start of the cold. They were randomized to no pills, a blinded placebo pill, a blinded echinacea pill, and an open-label echinacea pill. And um, So you could either get echinacea versus placebo blinded, or you could get open echinacea, or you could get open, um, open uh, nothing. So the people who got any pill, didn't matter what you got, had a non-statistically significant decrease in length and duration, uh, length and severity. There was uh, no advantage in the open label people who got echinacea, and um, they found a subgroup of people, 120 of them, who really believed that echinacea would help them. And oddly enough, no matter what pill those people got, no matter what pill, there was a decrease in the length of the uh, cold by 1.3 days, which is not in insignificant. Uh, and there was no statistically significant decrease in the severity of the cold. So they suggested that the belief that you, echinacea, will help you, and you give them any pill? <laughs> any pill? Well, no, I think this is a great, uh, great, this is really important. It says placebo worked a little. If you compared placebo versus you're not getting anything, placebo was better. But it was really better in the people who expected to get better. The ones who expected, oh, yeah, echinacea is going to work. I might get echinacea. That's where placebo really works. And, uh, you know, I, uh, brilliant. I love it. So, so we should always use the placebo effect without using placebos. That's what they suggest. The author suggests that perhaps beliefs about treatment should be taken into consideration. Well, I, I don't think it means you give them a phony medicine. It means you be enthusiastic about getting better. We, we, I'm giving you this. You to have to drink tea in the morning, and you're going to be better in, in, in two weeks. It's, it's really strong. Be careful. Sit down <laughs> when know, you're drinking it. Yeah, exactly. Just, you know. <laughs> It'll knock you right off your feet. Call me in the morning. <laughs> All right. That's number 30. Jerry, got any uh We do. As soon as you, as soon as you press the button. the button. So we only have one correspondent. It's for our, our faithful friend, Ken Grauer. Ken um, writes about uh, CT coronary angiograms. And uh, we've done uh, too many papers about that. And he um, agrees with many of the comments I made about why they don't work, and uh, including that we don't know what to, what it means when you find a finding on a, one of these studies. Uh, is that coronary artery disease doesn't mean anything because we don't know which plaque is dangerous and vulnerable and which one isn't. And he adds that in addition, there's you know one of the important things is to understand that um, for stable angina with just coronary nar narrowing, we don't know, there is no treatment. That PCI is not better than medical treatment. So that, you know, is an additional thing that goes on to it, uh, goes on with it. He also says, and I think this is useful, we were talking about optimal medical therapy for coronary disease, and we were talking about um, uh, statins and aspirin and antiplatelet agents, but he says it really should be about controlling symptoms of angina, which involves optimal use of a tolerated and upwardly titrated combination of not just beta blockers, but also calcium blockers and a long-acting nitrate. And we didn't talk about nitrates, which I think is a really critical, important point, and that great, great point. Uh, Ken also mentions, as he has in the past, that he has a long history of doing office treadmills, which he thinks has value greater than in the studies you read because of 
much more close attention to details. You know the patient really well. You see how they respond, and you watch them as it goes on. It's not just a matter of measuring numbers, etc. That may be true, but I don't. You know, I don't. I, we'd have to take it on faith. I, um, I certainly can't validate that it's true, but I, I think it's a reasonable point of view. Anyway, thank you for writing that, and I uh, certainly those other points I think we are do appreciate really your important. letters, comments, suggestions. Email oh, us. I did want to say, you know, it's usually it's book time, so I have two books I, uh, I'm going to mention this month. Um, I read a lot of books, and um, most of them I can't, you know, that strongly recommend. But I will recommend one novel and one nonfiction. The novel is um, Valerie Martin's book called Trespass. Valerie, it's not her best book, but it's a good book. It's not great, but it's good. But she's written some really, really good books. If you haven't read The Unfinished Novel, which is a not a novel, it's short stories, it's terrific. And Property is a novel, is a terrific one. Um, but I really like her. She's really, really good. And then for the nonfiction for this month, I mentioned our, our good buddy, uh, Howard Brody, wrote a book called The Golden Calf. Uh, Howard, as some of you know, we've talked about him before, he's a, an, a family physician who has been an expert in placebo, writing about placebo. He's written about placebo. He's written about drug companies. He's also a PhD philosopher who has written a bunch of books on ethics. This book is very different. It's about uh, our recent economic collapse in, in the Western world. And it's entitled The Golden Calf, which he refers to as uh, what he calls um, echo what does he call it? Not economics, um, economism. And what he means by ism is a, a religious belief in a school of, quote, economics, um, neo neoliberal economics, which he describes very carefully and very convincingly as a religion, not a science. That is, it's a religion. He shows all its roots and in, in, in certain fundamentalist beliefs. and But it's also a religion in the sense that it's, and not a science, that it's, it is impervious to evidence. It doesn't matter how much you prove it's wrong. We still find reasons to, its supporters find reasons to believe it. It's belief based basically on faith. And he, I think he suggests that uh, um, how much harm that has caused us. I doubt that Howard's a, a, an expert in economics, but the book itself is not about that detail. It's about this belief system. And while I have to admit that if you're expecting a bodice ripper, uh, this is not it. <laughs> Howard's a philosopher, and this is one step by another. It's very logical, and it's slow going. Um, it is very in his way. It's very smart and thoughtful and persuasive. So, um, you know, I, uh, for those of you who are willing to to delve Suffer into it, it, to delve into oh, it. No, I, I don't. No, that's that would be way overstating it. But no, it's, what would it's, I know? It's he, you would be suffering. But no, it, but it's it it is a, you know it's a long argument. It's a long, well reasoned argument, and I enjoyed it a great deal. And I think it's basically right. So there you go. There we go. That's the uh, what in January, PCMA. Thanks for listening. January two thousand forty-three. No, no, no. Two thousand twelve. All right. Bye. We'll talk with you next month. Thank you. <laughs> Take care, everybody.